Hey, Deep Chatters, I'm Leah Morris here with my co-host Jennifer Butler, and this is Deep Chats Podcast, where we have raw discussions about real life. Each week, you can expect unfiltered, no BS conversations from the heart about topics that actually might matter to you. We're just a couple of relationship coaches who want to cut through the small talk and dive deeper. So thanks for joining us on this journey, and be sure to subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. Hey, Deep Chatters. Leah and Jen here. Today we're talking about loving someone without possession while staying true to ourselves. And we came to this topic right before we hopped on our call. We wanted to make sure that whatever it is we're talking about is relevant to us. Um, As you know, this is unscripted. And I think, you know, Jen and I are both, we're both going through some interesting transitions within our romantic relationships. Um, And the, I guess the topic of possession, meaning like needing to identify, needing to have some form of certainty, needing to feel secure or reassured in certain ways. Um, How do we love without that? while we're still maintaining a a sense of our own needs and still maintaining, you know, the values that it is that we need to cultivate for ourselves too. So it's going to be a really interesting conversation today. And yeah, Jen, why don't, why don't you start us off? Yeah. You know, I love this conversation because I think it comes up in all of our relationships, right? Like it comes up with romantic love, but it comes up with friendships. It comes up with our parents. I mean, everybody right and you know as I've been dealing with this in my life currently um what I've noticed is it's almost like that need for certainty or that need for um assurance Mm -hmm. is that younger part of myself like I can almost feel it in a different part of my body. Like when I want to like kind of reach out and hear the person say, yeah, let's, you know, take this to the next level or let's make this exclusive or will you be my girlfriend or whatever that is. I feel it like in my chest, right? Like I feel it high. And if I act on that, which I think in the past I have, And I think I've created a lot of relationships around that, probably even my marriage. Mm. Um, Yeah, then I'm sourcing from this younger part of myself. But when I'm able to like really just sit with that and like breathe and like really kind of feel into that deeper part of myself, I don't feel that same need, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Like it doesn't feel... I don't need the same sort of assurance. I'm, I'm, I feel okay Mm -hmm. being more in the uncertainty. It's like, yeah, it's like that inner child is sort of, and, and we do that too. You know, we take like these little wounds that have been untended to from our childhood and then we carry them into our romantic relationships and we're like, fix this for me. Feel yeah. this for me. And cool. I mean, no matter how aware we are of that, um, it's really hard not to feel that like visceral physical response to not feeling safe, to yeah. not being reassured. And like, I feel it in the same place too. I think here, like in my throat, like it is very high and it's, you know, it's hard to sit with that for a while and not feel like you want to rip your hair out yeah. and not feel like you're going to, you know, have a panic attack because deep down inside there's a little, little, you know, version of us that's like, it's okay. Like needing to be soothed. So how do we one of, well, first of all, how do we identify what that is? And I think you've like done that. And I think I've done that too, but first identifying it and then dealing with it. Like what, what's the process then? Well, I wonder too, if identifying it 
more specifically, you know how like when you name a feeling, yeah, how like the more specific you can name the feeling, the less intense it is, like automatically the intensity just <sighs> once you like name it. So it's almost like if you can name the story that your younger self is in, mm -hmm. like specifically, right? So like, yeah, I'm being triggered. I know where I feel it. It's my younger self, <clears throat> but what's the story I'm in? Like, I know for me, when I'm in this story right now, it's my, I'm alone. I'm alone. I'm always going to be alone. Anyone I date isn't going to want to take it to the next level with me because I'm destined to be alone. And that's her story. But like when I see, and like when, when I like kind of get specifically on it, then I can like address the specific story. Like, whoa, like, you know, that's so not the reality or the truth, the deeper truth. And then I can really kind of speak to her on that, like in a specific way. Um, so I almost feel like it's the same as like when you name a feeling, because when I talk to her, like, you know, you're in charge of how alone you are. It's up to you to make yourself present. It's up to you to make yourself available. And when you do, that's how you create connection. When you take up time and space, you create connection. Then I can work with it. Yeah, totally. I, I think the naming of it, you're absolutely right. And the more specific we can name the thing and the story, like, that's interesting that that's your story. Yeah. You know, it's like, cause I, being in the uncertainty that I've been around, been in recently with, with my partner where he's not really sure how he feels. He's not really sure what's exactly going on. We've been together for nearly three years. Um, that uncertainty, I felt that before he said that, because that's my story. That's my story that I carry into all my relationships is like, people aren't gonna show up for me consistently. Mm. Like there, there is a limit to, to when they're done and you should hold your breath because it's coming. And so, but, but like living with that story and living with that idea, of, I mean, I think I've asked him like so many times in the past, like year and a half, like, are you sure you want to be with me? Or, you know, are you sure you feel that way? Do you, do you love me? Um, and it's created such a toxic environment in so many different ways because I ha was afraid of the toxic environment that my story had created, you know, of, I don't know if this is totally making sense, but I feel like, I feel like you understand what I'm saying here. And so coming to a place that I even have written here, like I've written down my story of, you know, I, I don't get supported consistently. I don't get nurtured. I don't get tended to, I, I don't get taken care of. Um, people are annoyed by me eventually that was my story. And so I took that and I rewrote a story. I wrote it like right here, but it says, I am supported, nurtured, taken care of, respected, admired, treated fairly, cherished, beloved, adored, and doted on. Like, this is not a story that I believe yet, <laughs> but it's definitely right. the opposite. And it's the story that I want to cultivate. Um, and that's really helped. It's sort of giving the antidote to the story yeah and then like i think finding a way to like connect because i think too we sometimes our story is just a part of us right like yeah. it's not all of us right and we can usually like if we really sink down deep we can find the part of us that is like that's not true you are supported you mm -hmm are loved you are cherished like you can find that it might be a sliver right it might just be a faint sort of felt sense but there's there's that part of us that that knows the deeper truth mm. and so it's like if you can i think find a way to connect with that part there's some power to that yeah i know for me it's been a lot of like um learning how to like if we, if I come from I'm alone, 
Mm -hmm. right? And I, and I show up in that story. It was interesting. Like I was um, sitting across from this person that I'm, I'm seeing. And um, there was like, I felt this like silence, right? We were like sitting at a table and it was quiet. And that's like my, one of my things, right? It's like, nobody wants to talk to me as deeply as I want to talk, right? I'm alone in my desire to have deep con communications with, a, with an intimate partner, right? And so that's where I come from, right? Like, I'm always going to just kind of be alone in this sort of desire for soulful connection. And I felt myself like, just tight and I had nothing to say. I had no words. And in my head, I'm going, see, this person isn't available for this. Right. And so I got, I could feel it. So I got up, I went in the bathroom and I was like, okay, where is this coming from? Right. Like, all right. So I am showing up in my story mm -hmm. and right now I'm in a trauma response. Right. I am like shut down. I'm not speaking. I am like totally focused on the fact that there's not, no communication. There's nothing for us to talk about. And I was like, that's just not true. Like, I won't know if that's true unless I show up from a different place. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's something to do with like figuring out which is the action that you take when you're in your, like that younger part of yourself versus the action and how you show up when you're in that other center, when you're sent, like you're showing up from that deeper center. And so I was able to like shift into that deeper part of myself and come back out and just like talk. Mm. Like my, I had my heart open, my energy shifted, my heart was open, I was available. And I just kind of talked and like, you know, I, I was so like, just alone, right? Mm -hmm. And I opened up and we started talking. Like there was there was no limit to the conversation. I think we talked for like two hours straight after that, <laughs> right? Like, and I was just like, holy cow. Like had I stayed in that story, yeah. the reality I would have created was we have nothing to talk about. Yeah. And I would have believed that. And I would have probably blamed him. Yeah and made it about him. Like, he's just not the guy for me because he's not available. Oh my God. Yeah. But I showed up from a different place. So I think there's some sort of power in that. It's like the action. It's like, what totally. action do we take from where? Totally. I mean, God, I can relate to this on so many levels. I feel like yeah. I mean, and I think I, I've like, just to like kind of play off your story when you allow that old narrative, that, that, Im that emotionally immature narrative to be the one that's in control. You, I mean, I ended up blaming him. Yeah. I, I ended up blaming my partner and all my partners before, you know? Um, and, and yeah, it is coming from an old trauma response. It's coming from an old victim mentality. And, and I think, that it's, it served its purpose, you know, it served its purpose at one time. There was a time we, when we were quote unquote, the victim, when we didn't have our needs met, when we should have been more supported, when we should have been given the space to fully express ourselves and get excited about like deep conversations. And we weren't. Um, and so we create that story to like save us from deeper disappointment, you know, like, well, just prepare because next time this is going to happen, you know, don't get your hopes up. Yeah. So, and survive too, I think sometimes oh, yeah. to survive. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, otherwise be sink, you know, sink into that hole of isolation and depression and loneliness. Um, but there, and you're right, there is so much power. There is so much power in being able to see that. And to say like, but what, what is the true story here? Yeah. You know, to differentiate between the, the story, the, the trauma story and the true story is such hard work, but it's so, and it's so hard to catch yourself without someone saying like, you're doing it again. I see you getting small. I see you shrinking. I see you tightening up. Um, I think it just, what is, I mean, I feel like it just takes being really present to your body 
and yeah and saying like I can feel myself getting tight I feel like that's where it starts is like ooh, what is this feeling again yeah yeah it is a lot of like physical feedback for sure totally especially when you're in in an uncertain place yeah like I think that's jarring for anybody nobody likes uncertainty I heard the saying one time that was like people would rather choose being unhappy than being uncertain and it's so true and it's and I mean that's true for for me in a lot of ways too and um and so how do we sit in that with ourselves sit in that like uncertain story of like I don't know how this is gonna end up I just know that the story I was telling myself it wasn't the truth um and the story that I'm trying to adopt, I'm not quite sure of. I don't quite believe completely, but I'm going to go for it. I'm going to show up differently. I'm going to be, I'm going to be in that story, regardless of how people react to it. You know what I mean? Like, how do you? Yeah, but maybe that's it. What you just said, like maybe if you're showing, maybe if that's all you have to think about is showing up differently then the person on the other side is either going to shift like you're either going to co-create a different reality Mm -hmm. or it's going to stay the same but then you're going to know do you know what i mean Uh, like maybe that's it in and of itself because then you're not, it has, then it has nothing to do with you controlling the person on the outside. They are the, because you can't, right? You can never control the person on the outside, but we are co-creators. Mm-hmm. So if we can sit back and say, okay, I know for sure I'm showing up in my truth. Mm-hmm. I might not believe it, but I know that I'm saying what I feel. I'm meeting my own needs. I'm setting boundaries. Like I'm doing whatever it is that I need to do in order to to not show up in my like wounded narrative. Mm. And then that dynamic never changes or it gets worse or that person, you know, maybe fades away or or that's kind of the amp. Then it kind of sorts itself out. Yeah, yeah. And just being okay with that. And just, but I mean, I, knowing that like, it's so hard because I think that when you're, when you're not, when you're coming from that, that wounded space, love and being in love and being in romantic relationships means so much more than it actually should. Yeah. Like it means, oh, now we're validated. Now we are worthy. Now yeah. we're whole. But when we're, when we're trying to like love in that way, it's like we have this white knuckle grip on what that's supposed to look like. Totally. So when we let go, yes, sometimes people do fade away, but we're not needing them to fill that void anymore anyway. Right. And so the fading away still feels like love. The fading away still feels like freedom and autonomy and wholeness because it's not dependent on them giving that to us because we're already coming from that place. Totally. Totally. And meeting our own needs, right? So if I'm meeting my own needs, I don't need someone else to meet them. Yeah. And then my, and then I can focus on like the healthy, ex- like, cause there are healthy expectations, right? Like I expect Mm-hmm. truth you know that's a healthy expectation in a relationship i expect respect i expect nonviolent communication right like there mm-hmm. are these healthy expectations that we should all have mm-hmm. um but those get jumbled up with these like needy expectations i need you to make me feel better i need you to make me happy i need you to heal me whatever and if we're meeting those needs ourselves then that frees us up, I think, for that freedom in mm-hmm. love, which is really how we want to love each other. I right? love each other so much that we feel free. Mm-hmm. 
That's so beautiful. And I, I just, I've never like, I've never felt that way until now. Yeah. Like legitimately the last like two weeks Mm. ever, not even like as a child, like, you know, it's always been like, well, there's conditions and stipulations and, um, rules and, 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 you know, rigidity and, and I think in, in some ways, like growing up, you need that structure, but like to have, to never feel totally comfortable being myself yeah, and giving myself what I need. And, you know, it's just, it's, it hasn't happened for me until just recently. And it's been, it's weird because it's like, I was telling somebody earlier this week, like, it doesn't feel as romantic. <laughs> totally. It doesn't. It feels like there's been this like death and rebirth of the way that I view love. Yeah. It's like suddenly I am this, I am this pillar that's standing on my own. And it's like, wow, there's no one here to help me stand. There's, I mean, of course you're supported by, you know, you have your support system, but like, I'm not depending on X, Y, and Z. I'm not depending on this person to make me, like, I'll stand regardless. Yeah. And then it's next to you is this other pillar. Mm -hmm. And then the co-creation that's happening, like, in between you. Um, But, you know, unlike every, I think, romantic movie that you see, it's not from a place of, like, I need you. It's from a place of, like, I choose to stand next to you. Yeah. So not romantic to me though. (laughs) No. And I think that's why so many people and me included for very, for a lot of years, I've been single a lot of years, Mm. partially because I don't know how many people I've dated that I've been like, it's not the one. I just don't feel all those sparks. My hands aren't getting sweaty. Like I'm just, you know, and, and now that I've grown, I'm like, oh, like, huh, mm. I don't, I'm not coming from this place of like, it's like, what is that joke? Like Jerry Maguire ruined it just for us all. It's like, you complete me. Like, mm-hmm. I think that's what I was looking for for a very long time. And like, mm. not looking for that anymore. Like I'm looking to like ease into love grow into love you know like create love together I'm not looking to like fall Mm. helplessly down the shaft right and like yeah feel out of control and you know there's an element I think of I don't I guess there's this element of freedom and letting go that comes from that strong pillar like you just said that feels very different so different so different. And I think too, I mean, the other portion of what we wanted to talk about was like the staying true to yourself. Yeah. Um, and I think, because I think the, the biggest question I've had was if I, if I surrender in this way, if I say like, okay, I don't need you to do X. I don't need you to be what you're not. Right. You know, if I surrender that, am I giving up my needs being met? And that that was my biggest fear was like, and I think also it's because, you know, coming out of like a narcissistic marriage where I think one of my biggest fears is like, I will never... I never want to end up there again. I never want someone else to tell me where my boundaries need to be right. or, or shouldn't be. And I never want to end up in a place where I feel like my needs don't matter as much as theirs. Yep. And so I have this, that adds to the narrative that adds to the childhood narrative. It's like this new adult wounded narrative. And, and so there's this fear of like, there's like this power struggle of that that kind of like gets intertwined with that as well and that can get really toxic and ugly and and so letting go of like you know actually um 
my value, I can still maintain my sense of, of values and not force someone else to be something that they're not at, at the same time. Like, for instance, you know, the, like the things that I was hoping to control from my partner, which were like, I want you to make up your mind. <laughs> you know, that doesn't have anything to do with my actual values. Right. Like he's being off that. That's my number one value is authenticity. He is yeah. being authentic in saying that he's uncertain. Yeah. That's not intruding on, on that at all. No, it doesn't make me feel as secure, but, but my values are, are still being met. You know, there is still love in that. There is still so much truth and so much balance. Like it's, I think we have to really like check ourselves and look at like maybe maintaining my truth has nothing to do with loving someone without possession. Sometimes I can see that being the case. Like if someone's like, I want to, you know, see other people and one of your values is monogamy and loyalty. Right. Like obviously that directly contradicts and I can see it being like, okay, well, I'm going to love you without possession in a way that I'm going to let you go. Right. Like, I'm going to, I'm not going to try to change you. Like we can't work because this directly conflicts with something that I need. That's non-negotiable. But, but other than that, I feel like a lot of these things like have nothing to do with, with the, I don't know. Do you, do you get what I'm trying to say? Yeah. And I think what you're saying is really important because I think that's why like one of the key starting points has to be like, what are your values? Yeah. What real, what do you really need in a relationship with anybody? You know, of course with a romantic partner, it's a little different, but I don't know though. I mean, you know, my, I know mine are like integrity Mm -hmm. and passion and purpose, um, freedom, Mm -hmm. you know? And so, but yeah, like if one of mine was family and I met somebody who didn't want family, I mean, I have a son, so that, you know, that goes without saying, I mean, that's, but to have more children or something like that's what you're saying. That's a non-negotiable and the loving choice. I mean, it's really choices, right? It's like, how do I make the loving choice? How do I love myself in the present conditions what's the loving choice i can make for myself and then what's the loving choice i can make for the relationship yeah yeah because you can't really make the loving choice for the relationship without making a loving choice for yourself right you're 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 feeding that relationship yeah you are not you know, making a loving choice for yourself, what are you actually feeding into the relationship then? Exactly. It's not coming from love anymore. It's coming from like lack or scarcity and fear. And um, ultimately that's, it's like a slow poison to a relationship, I feel. Yeah, I think that's where resentment comes from. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah, so then if you're making the loving choice to yourself and then you figure out what that is and you get clear on that, Mm -hmm. then how do I show up for the relationship in a loving way? And Mm -hmm. then you can like take actionable Mm -hmm. steps or make, create boundaries or Mm -hmm. that are aligned with how you can love yourself in the current conditions. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I totally, I get that. I'm wondering too, like, because I feel like, uh, you know, a lot of people might resonate with, the way that the conversation that brought us together in the beginning, which was because of our divorces. Yeah. Um, and so if you've ever, you know, been in a relationship like we have where there was some emotional trauma, I can't speak for you, but I can speak for me like a lot of stuff that I'm still working through years later. Absolutely. Like stuff that I'm just like, what? Like I, 
I didn't even know that was a thing until it was gone. And then I realized like how fucked up it really was. Totally. So I, I have an example. Yeah. A couple, I mean, a couple weeks ago, person I'm seeing, um, I was upset about something that happened. Mm -hmm. and I was like okay like if this were a friend I would just be like hey why'd you do that yeah I have so much emotional trauma from my relationship that I literally my hands were sweating I was so like prepared to hear something back at me like you're being so sensitive or really, why are you being so high maintenance or whatever those sort of responses are that are like, you don't deserve your feelings. Mm. Um, it was really hard for me to take that step to say, Hey, this is what happened. And I'm just wondering why, why you didn't blah, blah, blah. I felt, I felt hurt. I'm wondering, you know, I'm wondering why I'm just wondering what you're, where you were coming from. But the thing about it is, you know, taking the step was so hard. But what I realized was in taking that step, either A, I was going to learn some really valuable information that I was very clear I would never stand for again. And that was kind of going to be my answer. Or the other was going to happen, and which it did, which was like, total take some a, a man taking responsibility, taking ownership, apologizing and then making an amends all in one conversation and I was and like that that one 10 minute period healed probably 10 years of just really really traumatic emotional like terror of ever kind of expressing any sort of you know disappointment or anything like that and I was like, wow, like that felt amazing to have a man show up that way. And then the possibility is like, wow, <laughs> right? Like, this is what it feels like. This is what it's supposed to be. Like, this is what's possible. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like they say, you know, don't, it's, it's, there's so many complexities here because what we're saying on one end of it is like, we got to heal ourselves. Yep. But there is so much healing that happens when we're in relationship. Oh, for sure. We need proof that it's one thing to like change our story internally and then to like work towards creating that reality for ourselves. It's another thing to have our story dismantled in the experience with, with somebody who we, we, we may have been telling that story about before, like to have, someone yeah. who is like that masculine energy holding space for you and remaining present and staying you know tender to whatever it is that you're having to say like how oh, that must have been so transformative you know for that story that you have of like yeah. oh this is actually possible and it's easy for somebody some people to do it actually i'm not even asking too much totally yeah yeah and i guess in some i mean at the end of the day, yeah, when you do things in relationship, I think they are for sure. I think they're more powerful. Look, we're human beings. We're created for connection, right? Like we thrive on connection and, and loneliness and isolation is like an epidemic now. Like we don't do well when we don't connect with other human beings. And that doesn't mean you have to be married. And that doesn't mean that you have to be in like a, a, one-on-one -on -one relationship or anything like that but it does mean that we do become our best selves when we're surrounded and connected with people and so but i think even still the healing really i think came from me t doing the action right because well, I don't know, right? Like, had he responded the other way, it might have validated my trauma, but, or, or maybe not. Maybe it would have been like, okay, I'm, you know, becoming present to this. Like, 
here was my opportunity. Like, okay, this is the response. I'm going to walk away. I don't know. Right. I guess like no matter what happens, it's what you make of it. Yeah. I think it starts with awareness Yeah, because then, I mean, it's not necessary. I don't think it's necessarily like it doesn't start with the choice. It's it, it starts with the awareness and the awareness creates the choice. Right. You know, like, okay, this is how you can choose to see how this happened. Even if you are being treated the exact same way that you feared being treated, the choice comes in like how you're perceiving that, like, you know, because suddenly like, oh, this is now a lesson or right. this is now an opportunity for me to walk away or draw a boundary, or this is, you know, an area that I'm still feeling like triggered by. Um, whatever it is, suddenly you have a choice and it's not coming from this unconscious place anymore. Yeah. It's coming from a conscious place and a, a self-aware place. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think like what you're saying, like he could have reacted negatively. Um, I mean, our relationships still might not work out. <laughs> yeah. Like really, but like at the end of the day, I think being aware that we are not, we are not needing to live from that child narrative, that wounded child narrative. And we're also not needing to live from that like five years ago, adult narrative or however long ago it was for you, you know, like there's also a narrative that's been built as, as like an adult woman that's wounded and and understanding like these are versions, these are stories, these are like phases in our lives and who are we now? Like who, what do we welcome in now? Like what are we choosing now? What's our choice? Yeah. Um, and I think that's where the, where the real power lies is just continuing, like you said, to like really define a name and get super clear and specific about like, you know, what is it? what's what's the story what's your story um because my story is very different now from what it was my whole life and so I think it's going to take some time for me to reiterate that over and over again and to become fam so familiar with it that I know it like the back of my hand but that's where the magic happens I think totally I think that's where like I know clients will kind of get stuck is like okay, see that, but how do I like show up that way? Like, you know, how do I get past that point? <clears throat> and at the end of the day, you know, I'm always like, there's something in that Nike saying, <laughs> you just got to do it. Like yeah. you can have all the aha moments. You can read all the books. You can have all the coaches. You can see it all in your head. But at the end of the day, you're the one who has to take the step. Like you're the one who has to say no. You're the one who has to say how you feel. Like you just have to be willing to, I think just be really uncomfortable sometimes, be really messy, right? Like these are all new skills. If, like, you know, I didn't have the skill of setting boundaries. You know, it looked really messy when I started learning how to do it. I didn't have the skill of like being honest about my feelings and asking for what I need. Like, it was super awkward when I started learning how. It was like, probably I babbled a lot and words came, like, you know, it's just, but I think it's just that at the end of the day, like there is this point where you just have to be willing to just do it. Yeah. Yeah. And do, doing it scared. Yeah. Oh my God. Exactly. I had a client tell me one time, you know, I was like, what, what's, choose a mantra. Like choose some, and her mantra was do it scared. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's so genius. And I feel like I need that too. It's like yeah. do it and and do the thing that you're scared of. Do it scared. Yeah. You know, um, don't wait till you're brave to do it. Right. It's not gonna happen. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Do you have any parting words? Man, to wrap this up, I mean <laughs> I guess, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, it really does come down to just 
finding the ways that you need to like what you need to do in order to be as aware and present to your own self as you can be so that no matter what you do you're choosing mm -hmm. right because i think i can live with a bad choice yeah if next week if i make a choice today and next week it turns out i was wrong at least i can say well i chose mm -hmm. as opposed to if i am just blindly being led by my past and my wounded narrative and I'm just kind of going on old habit mm -hmm. that's when I think we get so mad at ourselves and we get so down on ourselves and because we're not choosing we're just living this like mm -hmm. in a zombie life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like at the whim we think we, we think we don't have choices I love that I can live with a bad choice too for sure yeah. Yeah, but yeah. like to not to not choose, I think, is a cop out. <laughs> but I think it's how most of us live. Yeah. You know, I think, I, I mean, I lived that way for a long time. I wasn't present to all the choices that were in front of me. I didn't consciously choose, mm -hmm. you know, yes, I'm going to let this man behave this way towards me. Mm -hmm. I just let it happen. Mm -hmm. because I was so centered in that old narrative mm -hmm. yeah yeah I, I think let's see if I had a, some parting words I, I think a big part of this for me has been like the possession piece and like the need to have my expect expectations be met in all ways um it, it's not, I think, it's not easy to, to not hold someone else responsible for you and your feelings at all. It's so much easier to make everyone else responsible. Yeah. God, so much easier. Um, so I think at the end of the day, like, something I've been asking or not asking myself, but telling myself is like, if I'm not feeling a certain way, I have the choice to fix that. Like there's always a choice. There's always a decision. And it's, it's literally in no one else's hands. It's always in my hands. Yeah. If I'm not feeling cared for, then I can choose to handle that in a different way right? I can care for myself more. Typically, there's always like a mirror aspect to all of this anyway. And you're just like, oh God, that's actually me. <laughs> I'm not supported because I haven't asked for support. Yeah. I'm not, you know, respected because I haven't respected myself. Yeah. So there's always a choice. And I think to really, truly like come to a place where you're loving without possession and loving yourself at the same time is to know that, that you're responsible and you're, you always have that choice. I love that choice is such a big word for this. Yeah. So true. I agree. And I think as you were just speaking, I was like, gosh, when you love yourself, you're able to love without possession. There's like some freedom that happens when you truly love yourself by like meeting your needs and healing yourself and all of that. Maybe that's what opens up the freedom, the ability to love freely. Totally, totally. Because you had, I think, okay, so with your narrative of like, no one wants to really listen to me, no one's able to dive as deep with me. There's probably part of you that's like doubting that what you have to say is valid or loving yourself enough to be like, say it. Yep. You know, and here you are now in this place where you love yourself enough to say these things and to have these deep conversations and, you know, to talk to a complete stranger on the phone, like you and I did. And that's like really get into it and not shy away from that, but to lean in, like, that's what it took for you to be held in that. That's what it took for you to see that people aren't going anywhere is for yeah. you to love yourself enough to show up for yourself. Totally. And then suddenly you don't need anybody to, to give you permission because you're giving yourself permission. Yeah. And then I think to know, like, I still sometimes have to, I hear myself go, just say it. Yeah. And I will, right. Because like that, I don't know that the story, you know, in some ways I think 
the story will always be there in some in some capacity yeah. and it's just like really learning how to hear the story like be present to it but then decide to take action from outside of that story right like i can still like i can feel the story come up when i'm like oh my god like i don't want to say that out loud or like should i say that and then i'm like huh i see that and then i'm like say it and then i'm like and then i say it right like that's how we continue to expand and like change that narrative and yeah yeah to just say it to just do it to to nike our life <laughs> exactly. uh, all right well this has been great i mean i have so many nuggets of gold to take away from it um yeah thank you deep chatters for again just being on this journey with us and we're excited and really grateful to be here so thank you To all you deep chatters out there, Leah and I want to thank you so much for listening. This is a podcast that's all about connection, so we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us on Instagram at Deep Chats Podcast. And if you haven't already, please go to iTunes to rate and review us. Every review helps other deep chatters just like you be able to find this podcast.